Hi, I'm Hannah Devinney. They, them pronouns, please. I'm a doctoral student at Umeå University in the Department of Computing Science and the Graduate School for Gender Studies, where I'm supervised by Henrik Bjerklund and Jenny Bjerklund. I'm very pleased to present to you our paper, Theories of Gender in NLP Bias Research. Issues of fairness and bias in natural language processing models, systems, and research are important concerns within the NLP community. People who are researching biases are generally trying quite hard to do a good and thorough job. We understand that biases cause harm and are seeking to minimize or ideally eliminate those harms, but we are not immune to normative assumptions. Because of this, there's been an increasing interest in exploring how bias is defined, tested for, and mitigated, with several papers published in the last few years working on surveying the field with these kinds of questions in mind. But while gender bias is certainly one of the most popular biases to explore, there isn't really a corresponding study on how gender is defined. This paper seeks to fill that gap and also to provide some guidance towards defining and handling gender in more inclusive ways. Our research questions focus on exploring how papers within the field of NLP bias research define or discuss gender in a theoretical sense, as well as how these definitions are implemented or operationalized in practice. Some of the relevant sub-questions are, is a theory of gender discussed? And if so, which ones? Do these theories draw from literature outside of NLP, such as from gender, queer, and feminist studies? Where if theory of gender isn't explicitly discussed, what does the underlying theorization behind the methods seem to be? And how do the ways that gender is treated connect to the ways that bias is defined and measured? To answer these questions, we collected 176 papers over two phases. This lets us get a bit of an idea of how the field is actively shifting. Round one consists of 126 papers collected in June of July of 2020 and primarily draws from the bibliographies of a few other survey papers, mostly Blodgett et al. Round two consists of 50 papers, which are randomly sampled from 85 papers collected in September of 2021, following the methodology described in Blodgett et al. We read all of these papers and categorize them according to the way that gender is theorized, the definitions and or measures of gender bias, the technology of interest, which proxies are used to operationalize gender, whether or not gender was the only or primary focus, the language or languages investigated, and whether or not the gender as a binary was problematized. Some of the key findings from this categorization, which I'd like to emphasize here before moving on to the discussion are that Generally, papers try to isolate gender from other factors, such as race or class or religion. Nearly half of the surveyed papers do not define what they mean by gender in the paper. Instead, the definition of gender is often left to be inferred by the reader when interpreting methods or results. Papers are overwhelmingly binary, considering only men and women when operationalizing gender, although this is getting somewhat better, as we'll discuss later. A minority of papers were categorized as essentialist, meaning that they directly exclude trans people in their methods by directly linking gender to body parts and or by asserting that there exists some fundamental difference between men and women. The folk model of gender is by far the most common way that gender is thought about or not thought about as the case may be in the literature. In brief, it is the common unspoken understanding of gender as something that is binary, so there are only two possible categories generally taken to be men and women. It's immutable. Once you're assigned a category, it's not possible to switch between them. And it's physiological. Assignment to categories is somehow based on physical characteristics. We find evidence of this model both in methods and analyses, especially in papers where gender is underspecified. In these cases, the definition of gender following the folk model is sort of taken for granted or assumed to be common knowledge. We note that there are three key risks, which include potential harms as well as actual current harms to use this model. First, it erases trans, non-binary, and intersex people, further putting them in harm's way by being unintelligible to systems. It also reduces cis people, especially cis women, to a sort of shallow stereotype by putting limits on what it means to be a man or a woman. And perhaps most importantly, this model is completely at odds with the goal of bias research. It cannot produce fair NLP outcomes because it is guaranteed to exclude vulnerable populations from consideration in the first place. 
The folk model is an element of cisnormativity, but it's not the only ways that theories of gender can be cisnormative. Cisnormativity is the assumption that everyone is cisgender, i.e. that their gender identity and expression match the sex that they were assigned at birth. And a key problem is that this assumption becomes a standard within the field. So it sort of self-perpetuates as researchers follow what other researchers are doing. Throughout the next few slides, I'll give some examples of ways that cisnormativity appears in practice. We find evidence of cisnormativity in methods but with both proxies, which operationalize gender, and metrics, which operationalize bias. In proxies, cisnormativity happens through, for example, reliance on pairs, sets of matched words that differ only by gender, like man, woman, or boy, girl. Another common strategy is have to have lists of definitional words. Um, so that's often the same kinds of words as are found in the pairs, except they're not word by word set matched up, which becomes a problem when some of the terms considered definitional are physiological in nature. And the last strategy that I'll point out here is using first names as proxies for gender. This strategy relies on some major assumptions, that names are reliably gendered, that this genderedness holds true across all other demographics, such as age or cultural background, and that there's some majority threshold that exists that lets us confidently gender a name. For metrics, cisnormativity mostly occurs as a reliance on opposites, which are easy to conceptualize and measure. It can also come through by only examining the difference in performance for two groups, which is always men and women. Cisnormative methods are not always a consequence of not thinking to or not wanting to include trans and non-binary people. Unfortunately, there are some additional issues that seem to cause stumbling blocks for researchers. On the one hand, there's the desire for comparison with previous cisnormative research, which leads to replicating these methods. On the other, there's a data sparsity problem. Trans and non-binary people are already a minority group, and then we're generally even further underrepresented in data sets. This leads to situations where it can be very hard to compare results between, for example, associations with pronouns he, she, and neopronouns like z. Cisnormativity in analysis uh, can happen even when methods are otherwise not cisnormative or exclusive of trans and non-binary people. One example we explore in the paper is found across several papers. It concerns swapping gendered terms for data augmentation purposes. These papers caution against swapping all terms and give the example sentence, he gave birth in order to illustrate their point. They consider it to be, quote, meaningless, nonsensical, or presenting biologically inaccurate facts. Plenty of people who are referred to with he, him pronouns give birth and have for a really long time. It's completely biologically accurate and is meaningful and sensical in its appropriate context. When we know that the he is trans or that the birth is metaphorical to, for example, giving birth to a movement, this isn't an uncertain or semantically ambiguous sentence. Another way that cisnormativity appears is in attempting to preserve useful parts of gender bias in gendered associations that may be considered positive, neutral, or even just non-offensive. But is it really true that beards are only for men and bikinis are only for women? And are these associations that we actually want to preserve? In general, cisnormative analyses seem to ignore any potential trans context. Often these unexpected sentences or associations that challenge our gendered assumptions actually imply and make clear that context. Okay, the good news is that when we look at the difference between the two rounds of the survey, we do observe a shift towards inclusivity. The number of papers categorized as binary is reduced. There are many more acknowledgements that gender isn't actually a binary in papers that model it as such. And there are more trans inclusive methodologies. There's a clear desire in the field to do good and then to do better. We want to make it easier to get started in thinking and discussing theoretical positionings with respect to gender. So the last section of our paper goes into detail with our general recommendations moving forward. To condense them here, we suggest that theorization of gender always be made explicit because talking about normative assumptions helps both authors who can check back in and make sure everything lines up and readers who then know what to expect and how they should be thinking about the connections between the theory and the method.
We also recommend that you do this work early and check back in on your theory of gender throughout the research process so that you can align your methods with your theory. This is good because then we avoid having to make disclaimers such as gender isn't a binary, but we model it as such in the first place. Third, we recommend that you talk about gender using consistent, respectful, and accurate language. Often in the survey, we would see terms male and female used to refer to people where men and women would be more appropriate and accurate, and also used to refer to grammatical genders, where the convention in linguistics is generally to use the terms masculine and feminine. Also, we <laughs> suggest that you borrow knowledge and methodologies from other fields and collaborate with people who have different knowledges. This can really open up the possibilities for thinking outside the box and producing novel methods for being inclusive. Finally, we offer an open bibliography on gender and queer studies, feminist and intersectional theory and methods, and other issues relating to bias, unfairness, and injustice. We hope you find it useful, and of course, suggestions are always welcome. It can be found at this link. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Here is a subsection of the bibliography that was referenced in these slides. And we'll see you in the Q&A.